Today we're talking about the Electoral College, the only college with a conservative bias. The Supreme Court just released a landmark decision where they had to decide whether electors voting in the Electoral College was goal line defense against a populist tyrant taking over or just a fun little gimmick of the United States Constitution designed to rubber stamp state election results and make 538 donors feel extra special. America's Electoral College has 538 state appointed electors who really vote for the president. If you win over half of them, you become president. Yay! When you're a state party looking for electors to appoint, you're truly going for yes men who would vote for anybody from Al Gore to Hector the Lump of Coal if they have your party's stamp of approval. So what's the problem? Well, unfortunately, Washington State's Democratic Party didn't do a great job picking their electors. So when Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine won the popular vote in the state, the electors were supposed to cast their ballots for Clinton Kaine. Instead, three of them voted for Golan Powell for president. Wait, what? Yep, he came in third place in the 2016 election because of those three Democratic electoral votes. He might have done even better if he, I don't know, was running for president. All I have to say here is poor Gary Johnson. I mean, at least vote for the guy who's trying. That dude needed a win. Of course, Washington State was none too happy about this development, and the Washington Secretary of State fined the electors $1,000 each for failing to vote for the nominee of their party in violation of state law. The question is, can a state punish an elector for not voting for the candidate who won the popular vote in their state? And the answer was a unanimous 9-0 flawless victory. You can punish electors who don't vote along party lines. With that, let's get to Justice Kagan's majority decision to figure out why. While most Supreme Court decisions are about acts of Congress, this one goes back to the OG founding document itself the Constitution. The trouble comes down to whether you should take the Constitution at its literal word or try to figure out what the founders were going for and trying to build when they were establishing the Electoral College. As Kagan writes, whether by choice or accident, the framers did not reduce their thoughts about electors' discretion to the printed page. All that they put down about the electors was that we have said that the states would appoint them and that they would meet and cast ballots to send to the capital. Yeah, if a state can pass an elector nomination strategy through its state legislature, well, it's probably going to be acceptable. She went on to rate that nothing in the Constitution expressly prohibits states from taking away presidential electors' voting discretion as Washington did. Glad to hear we're using Airbud logic to figure this one out. You check in your rule book, but you won't find anything in there that says a dog can't play. He's right! Ain't no rule says a dog can't play basketball! And ain't no law in the Constitution that says states can't ban electors from voting for someone other than the person who won the popular vote in that state. To further emphasize the vagueness of the Constitution regarding electors, Article 2 includes only the instruction to each state to appoint, in whatever way it likes, as many electors as it has senators and representatives. Beyond that, go crazy. We're really winging it here with these elector laws too. Only 32 states and DC have laws explicitly requesting electors go with the popular vote, and 15 of those have specific monetary punishments assigned to those. So much of this is really up to the state legislatures as to what to do. Now on the other side of the argument, the find electors opening arguments probably started with the phase Webster's Dictionary defines democracy as. They state that Article 2 names the members of the Electoral College electors. The 12th Amendment then says that electors shall vote and that they shall do so by ballot. The plain meaning of these terms requires electors to have freedom of choice. If the states could control their votes, the electors would not be electors, and their vote by ballot would not be a vote. It's almost like taking away what little agency electors have just makes this whole process a complete waste of time.
Here's your ballot. I reject the right answer. Just hand it back to me and act validated. No, I get the I voted sticker. Kagan's anti-semantic response to this definitional attack was, hey, a compelled vote, still a vote. Those words did not always connote independent choice. Suppose a person always votes in the way his spouse or pastor or union tells him to. We might question his judgment, but we would have no problem saying that he votes or fills a ballot. In those cases, the choice is in someone else's hands, but the words still apply because they can signify a mechanical act. She is right. They technically vote using ballots regularly in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, where Kim Jong-un seems to do pretty well in most elections. Man, I really thought Political Prisoner 456 had this one in the bag. Compelled voting is still legally considered voting, so this is technically constitutional. Man, that's a bit alarming for a 9-0 opinion though. Before I end this episode, I just want to take a step back and make sure we're all on the same page about what has just been decided here today. First, the state electors are not random people picked off the streets. These are groups of hand-selected people by state parties who are granted the opportunity to choose candidates if their party wins the popular vote in that state. Now, if I was Trump, and even if the Supreme Court had ruled the other way, I'd much rather be trying to pitch myself to electors chosen by a Republican state committee than a Democrat state committee, even if they have the complete freedom to choose between me and Joe Biden. It's still a game, but you have a Harlem Globetrotters level advantage over the other guy. Now, For decades, more than half of states have put in guardrails protecting the democratic will of the state majority from electors who might decide they know better than them. This is just the first time anyone's ever raised their hands and said, gee, that seems wrong. The court reaffirmed that this is not unconstitutional, which means that the literal one half of 1% of electors who decided to go off on their own and vote for people like Colin Powell instead of Hillary Clinton might not be able to do that anymore, or at least they'll have to pay a fine for that decision. Basically, the Supreme Court looked at the status quo and said, keep on quoing. This will be a striking blow to Colin Powell's 2020 chances, but for the rest of us, it just ensures that our vote will be fairly represented by the state's electoral results. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, first I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the courts, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you liked what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.